morning. It's a beautiful morning to worship in the Lord's house today. Amen. Amen. A couple quick announcements before we get started with worship. Uh, tonight is game night. So at 6 o'clock, uh, back in the Family Life Center, uh, this week bring your own snack and your own drink uh, instead of sharing snacks. Uh, but we'll be playing Euchre back there, and if you want to play other games, you can bring those as well. Uh, if you don't know how to play Euchre and want to learn, Lily will teach you, and you can take the last place trophy home this week. <laughs> uh, today is, uh, this week is the last week to sign up for the, uh, the Nazarene District golf outing. Uh, there's information out there on the foyer. Uh, the money has to be postmarked by July 23rd. Uh, so if you're interested in playing, it's $45. Uh, that includes your round of golf, uh, lunch afterwards, and then the first three golf balls you lose that day are provided for you. And then uh, the mission service uh, that was supposed to be in July has been rescheduled to the second Sunday of August uh, for the bonfire service. It'll be August 9th at 6 o'clock at Brittany and Paul's house. There will be uh, food and fellowship around the fire, so they'll be having chicken quesadillas, hot dogs, uh, chips, s'mores, and drinks. Uh, there'll be a, a sign-up sheet out there on the coffee bar that looks like this. So you can see the items on there that they're looking for people to help bring. Um, also, don't forget to bring your own chair. And if you want to go swimming, to bring your swimming trunks and a towel. All right. Let's have a great morning of worship. Good morning. Can we rise? Let's do the wave. Start at the left. Go to the right. Don't touch anyone. Um, I'm really excited about game night tonight. I'm psyched. Let's see if Travis can uh, defend his title of this trophy. <laughs> All right. Let's worship. your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead me by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. Your grace is enough. 
Thank you. 
church are we thriving here in this worn and weary land where many a dream has died. Like a tree planted by the water, we never will run dry. So living water flowing through, God, we thirst for more of you. Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire. Just to know you and to make you know we lift your name on high. Shine like the sun, make darkness run and hide. We know we were made for so much more than digging deep to know your father's heart into the world we're reaching out to show them who you are so living water flowing through god we thirst for more of you fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire just to know you and to make you know we lift your name on high shine like the sun make darkness run and hide we know we were made for so much more than ordinary lives it's time for us to just survive. We were made to thrive. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable. Anything is possible. 
much more than ordinary life. It's time for us to more than just survive. We were made to thrive. Hey! your word take your message to those who maybe don't know you or need to come back to you we give you the blessing and we praise you as pastor grab as his team brings us the message this morning we love you lord in jesus name amen Blessed is the man who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. But the man who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night, he is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, prospers. the next uh, three weeks that um, that passion, passage is, is written on your hearts and it's played out in your lives, not just over the next three weeks, but over the course of your life. I hope that becomes truth for you, reality for you. Uh, children, you are dismissed uh, for Children's Church. Uh, we have a special speaker coming this morning. Uh, his name is Joe Coomer. Everyone give Joe a round of applause. All right. <laughs> We're just going to ease some tension or create some more. I don't know. Um, you know, it's, it, was a, it was a sad reality this year that um, some of our camps on our district level were canceled. And so not every child got to uh, experience camp. And it was kind of a bummer. Um, but our, our district leadership um, felt that with some changes that was happening and, and, you know, other things were at play that the best course of action was to cancel our younger camps. But... Um, uh, for Joe's sake, you know, the Lord was able to uh, make it happen to where uh, he kind of made the cut and was able to go to senior high camp. So he's here to share a little bit of his testimony uh, of his time at, at camp and to thank everybody because uh, our, our church paid for half of his scholarship. And so that was awesome for him to be able to go. So thank you for that. It's all you, Joe. Oh, you want a mic? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You going to sing a little number for us? <laughs> there you go, buddy. I'm ex- just to know I'm extremely nervous already, so if I stutter any, that's because I'm too nervous. But uh, yeah, so I went to uh, camp, and it was an amazing experience. Uh, met a lot of great people there, and uh, definitely felt like I was closer to God as uh, being there, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, so, yeah, like, seeing so many young people, like, want to be closer to God, that's just amazing, because, like, I know that there's, there's people that I've met that are, you know, teenagers or whatever, and they are not, they're not usually, like, they don't like to be open about their faith, 
because they feel like they're going to be judged. So just to see many people just not like not caring if they're going to be judged or whatever to be open about their faith, that was just amazing. And definitely felt like, yeah, like now I feel like I'm definitely closer to God because of that. Uh, so, yeah, and I never understood why people got, like, emotional during church. And now I totally understand why. <laughs> like, just how powerful the message can be. Like, how many emotions that brings to you. Like, I don't usually like crying in front of anyone. But uh, I was totally tearing up through all the, like, the, through, like, just like the message that I was told just about how much God really cares for you through all of what you do, like how how bad times get, like, you know, he always will be there for you just no matter what it is. So, yeah, that was an amazing experience, um, and I would totally like to experience that again. Say what? Like I get a <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's why it's so important. I'm so passionate. As, as many of you know, I'm the, I'm the preteen director, so I, I handle the preteen boys on our district uh, for all of Northeast Indiana. And so my camp was one of the camps that got um, canceled, so I was kind of bummed out about that. This year we were going to send a total of seven kids to camp. It's amazing, and six of them uh, unfortunately weren't able to make it. And so we're hoping and praying for for next year, so we're so glad that Joe got um, got to go. If you're wondering who Joe is, uh, he's the son of, of Erica, the lady who sings right here with her wonderful voice for the Lord, and, and Ryan's his stepdad, and then this is his grandpa, Joe, right? So there's no, uh, there's no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, that was your first time going to camp, so, so that's an awesome time. I'm glad he got to experience that. And so there's a bunch of teens in that back row back there that I can see are, are, are excited to go next year, right? <laughs> yeah, whatever. Get on with the sermon, Pastor. <laughs> okay, last week we started this series called Rooted about uh, how, do we, how do we grow deep roots so that we can live strong and successful in our faith and in our, in our life. And not only that, we didn't talk too much about that last week, but what does, what does a successful life look like? Because I'm telling you, in the eyes of God, it is completely different. It has nothing to do with wealth, okay? It has nothing to do with, with money or status or anything to live a successful life life in Christ is to to be in Christ. I mean, that's literally what it is, to grow deep roots of faith planted by the seed of the gospel, and so we can live strong and endure the trials of life. And this series has a lot of agricultural uh, imagery throughout it, and today we're going to be talking a little bit more about seeds and soil and growth. And did you see that seed I planted last week? Man, the Lord really worked some magic to even change species into something else, though. <laughs> so this is a basil, uh, so it's a sunflower basil. I was hoping no one would catch me on it, but right away James came in and caught me, and he even knew what it was. I was so shocked. And so uh, he needs an apron, so apparently he knows how to cook or something. Um, so <laughs> anyways, um, so here's the thing, though. Let me ask you a question. When we plant a seed, what do we expect? Growth. That's exactly right. So that's what we're going to talk about today. What, do, what should we expect after a seed is planted? And ultimately, um, we want it to grow and to bear and to be completely fruit, uh, fruitful in that. And so, um, you know, I think just like this plant here, when we look at it, there are a numerous different, you'll hear me say this a lot, agents of growth that are taking place that are part of this for, for this plant to get to where it is. Let's just pretend it really did grow, okay, for, for, for the sermon sake this morning. But um, what did it need? All right, what are some things that needed to create an environment of growth? Well, I mean, it needed a seed, right? It needed, it needed sunlight. It needed good soil. That's what we talked about last week. It needs water. It needs a place to grow, right? It needed this, this pot that I put it in. And, and, and that's what we're going to talk about today is a lot of this, this environment of growth that we surround ourselves with. And, and last week, we talked about, uh, like I said, we talked about the seed and the different kind of seeds from the, from the view of Scripture and the parable of the sower. And this week, we're going to talk about uh, all the necessary agents of growth in a believer's life to bring the Word of God to fru full fruit-bearing 
maturity in our lives? How do we apply what is said here uh, to our everyday life? Turn with me in your Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to spend some time there today, uh, verses 5 through 9. And we're going to look at this through uh, this lens to see uh, what it says about necessary agents of growth in the Christian life uh, through the lens of Scripture, as always. Uh, it will be on the board if you don't have it in your Bible. Well, you should have it in your Bible if you don't have a Bible with you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 and 9. I hear some pages turning still. It's right before 2 Corinthians. All right. It says this, What after all is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither the one who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers you are God's field, God's building. And it's so important, if you get anything out of what I'm going to preach today, I want you to get this, is that we have to remember today that it is God who makes things grow. You know, some of us are mature believers, and we've been planting and sowing seeds and scattering seeds in all different kinds of soil our whole life to introduce people to Jesus. And, and just like the parable, some of them, we don't see the harvest, right? We don't even see the growth at times. But the, the, the thing is, is we need to understand that it is God. We faithfully plant. That's what we're called to do. And, we, and everything else is up to God, really, whether it's going to grow or not. And I think sometimes we just hang on to that so much, and we get so discouraged when we don't see the growth, or when people just don't get it, and we want to take our big old Bible, and we just want to, you know, see if they can get it that way, but it, that doesn't work either, right? People tried that on me, and it never worked. And so, not literally, but pretty close. And so, I think my grandma threw a Bible at me once, but um, that's another story for another day. <laughs> but it, it's just do you know what I'm saying, though? Does anyone in here have that one friend or family or loved one where you're just like praying through, praying the blood of Jesus over them, and you're just wishing upon wish and hope upon hope in Jesus Christ that they would just get it, that maybe they would just wake up, or maybe that they would just dedicate a little more, or, or maybe why can't they see what God has done in your life, and why can't they believe that it's true for their life? I have many friends like that. I have many family members that are like that. I've shared, I, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. And now I'm sitting back and watching my family die. I'm watching them fade away. I'm watching them on a road to hell. And that's a very real thing. Because you know, they, they don't even know or understand Jesus or the, a basic precept from, from the Word of God. And it breaks my heart. And, and, and the Lord has, has grown some of the seeds that we've planted, but there's still those. That's why this message is so important. The seed matters. The soil matters. The water matters. The sunlight matters. All those things matter. You matter. The seeds you planted matter, right? The, the water you're trying to pour onto that seed, like it said, uh, Apollos watered, Paul replanted, all those things. Even the effort that we put into people's life, that does matter. I'm not saying you introduce people to Jesus one time and, and you're, you're done. Sometimes we got to drag people to Jesus. <laughs> it all matters. But at the end of the day, we need to know it's God who makes things grow. It's God. It's God. So this morning, I want to look at five truths from Scripture. There's many truths in Scripture, but I just want to look at five this morning. Uh, we're going to look at just the first two chapters again of that passage I just read. But here's the first truth for you. You can fill it, up in your, fill it out in your outline. It's this. And it's what I've been saying, that spiritual growth is not growth by human hands, right? That's so important for us to understand in our, in our discipleship, right? We need to understand that I cannot strong arm somebody into their faith, right? I just can't do it. I'm a pretty big guy, right? I could wrestle some people down, but that isn't going to get them to believe in Jesus, right? I wish it was that easy, man. I'd be going on crusades, right? That'd be so awesome, but it, it doesn't work that way. And so spiritual growth is not growth by human hands. Let's look at that first two verses again. It says, 
What, after all, is Apollos? What and what is Paul? Only servants. It's a key. Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. Let's stop right there in verse 5. To assign. Some of us are called to be pastors. Some are called to be Sunday school teachers. Some are called to be strong lay leaders or church board members or whatever it is. Or, or, or there to just spiritually uplift and edify one another. We're called each according to our own task. We're each given. We're not all given every spirit, Right? It says in Scripture, or every gift of the Spirit, it says in Scripture that the Spirit puts on the gift of how He chooses and how He believes. We're all uniquely gifted and blessed in different ways. Verse 6, I planted the seed, Paul says. Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. One of the neat things about Paul's ministry is a lot of times Paul was a church planner, really. Right? That's kind of what Paul did. Paul would go from town to town, all these journeys. If you look in the back of most Bibles, you'll see a bunch of maps, and you'll probably see some that talk about Paul's journey, and it kind of goes all over the place, all his journeys. And a lot of times, Paul, would he would go, and he'd have these Timothys and these Barnabases and these, these Silases and, and all these different, uh, these different men who he was raising up to be what? Pastors, right? Children's directors, <laughs> leaders, youth pastors, you know, not, not just that, you know what I'm saying, but people who are going to carry on and to water that seed, right? And that's what he was doing. He would go, and he would plant here, and he would leave here. Now, it would be really selfish and egotistical for him to be like, man, I can't leave till I see this place get to 500 people, right? I, I got to see that. I, I mean, look at the work I put in. Look at the work of my hands. That's, that's not how it works. And, and see, that's why, that's why Paul's writing this letter in 1 Corinthians. Man, they're fighting. They're arguing. They're quarreling about all these different aspects of faith. None of them were, were agents of growth, right? In fact, it was such a problem that this is pretty much what Paul talked about throughout the first two, well, the only two books of, of 1 and 2 Corinthians, that's what he talked about. And one of the specific arguments was over which leader <laughs> they were to follow, right? They must have felt that one was greater for one reason or another. And Paul clearly states that these men, what did it say in the passage? These men are just servants of God. Vessels of, of his grace, right? Vessels of, of his truth. And all this fighting has to stop. Because it's not going to produce kingdom growth. Spiritual growth was not, a and it is not, a result of human work. I don't care how many Bible studies you have for somebody. I don't care how many, there's no list of it takes six home studies to get someone converted. That's not how it works. God is the one who makes things grow. Can I get an Amen. And when we look at the commentary here, even not even, a, not even like a commentary book, but just Paul, the way Paul's talking about in this letter, he wrote it because it was intended to free us. He wrote that letter to, to them to free them as well, to free them from unnecessary comparisons, right? And to focus on God's work in their lives. And we can sit and compare ourselves all day long to the Presbyterian church, the Methodist church, the, the Baptist church, or all these other churches in our town. We can compare ourselves all day long, but they're them and we're us. And, and not only that, but it's about the kingdom and not the castle. You've heard me say that a lot. It's maybe been a while, but we should do everything we can to promote them. Because it's about God. Right? And Paul is saying, this has got to stop. Where's the unity? It doesn't matter if it's Apollos or if it's Paul or if it's Travis or if it's Matthew or if it's Dave or it's um, Harrison. It's not about that. It's about God. But unfortunately, you know, we continue to argue today. What's the best path for growth? What's the best church? Who has the most attendance? Who has the best music? Who has the best seating? Who has the best children's director, leader? We do. But who has the best? <laughs> no. Who has the best this? Who has the best that? What speaker is the best, right? What church has the most programs? Who has the biggest church van? <laughs> well, those are real arguments for people today. According to Paul... I talk negative about that kind of with the connotation there, but Paul says, guess what? All that matters. It does matter. 
It does matter that you're putting things into place. It does matter that you have a, a pastor who could preach. It does matter that you have a pastor who studies. It does matter that you have ch- people to lead children. It does matter. All that matters. But at the end of the day, it's about God. He is the one who brings the growth. Can I get an amen? amen. Number two, the second truth I see in this is in chapter or in verses 7 through 9. And this is kind of weird, but it says that we are God's field. What does that mean? We are God's, God's field. Let's read it. It says, so neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. Ouch. That hurts, right? Right? Because I want to be recognized as being a good preacher, right? Right? <laughs> I'm obviously being sarcastic. It says, they're nothing. They're, they're not anything. But only God who makes things grow. Verse 8, the one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. And they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. Key, key verse here, verse 9. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field. You are God's building. Man, it's so good to know that God's interested in our growth. Amen? That's right. I think that, yeah, we're the body of Christ. Yeah, I think that he sees each heart, each person, each soul, each being as a field that should be ready to bear fruit. Verse 9 says that we are God's co-workers in growth. It's, in, in growth. it's so interesting. And so we ask these questions like, like how, can we, how can we practically aid God in his work? We're just, we're just fallible humans, right? I'm going to mess something up, <laughs> right? I, I mean, I'm a mess up. I'm a goof. I put my foot in my mouth all the way up to my knee all the time, weekly basis. That's my wife. And so how can we possibly help God? Well, here's some things. I think we must, we must act with wisdom and we must immerse ourselves in community and in, in church with other people who love Jesus and are growing themselves as well. They're working towards actively becoming closer to God and we do that through community. I think we've got to dedicate ourselves to reading God's word. Man, pastor, you beat that drum all the time, right? Because it's so important. It's the basics that you need to hear over and over again as a reminder because a lot of us, like I've said last week and the weeks before, we get so excited about the Word of God and we leave this place and something happens and the enemy snatches that seed away. And so we need to be reminded that, yes, I need to pray. (laughs) Yes, I need to read the Word of God. Yes, I need filled up. Yes, I need some spiritual fuel so my fire can burn. We must regularly worship Jesus, here's the thing, with our whole lives. With everything we do, whether we eat or drink, (laughs) whatever we do, for the glory of God. We must constantly, this one hurts, we must constantly uh, evaluate our lives and repent of our sin. That's tough. That hurts. That's why we talk about it. All the time, the last Sunday of every month, we have communion, and communion, we got to stress the importance of it, right, Ryan? We got to stress that. We got to talk about that. Me and Ryan just had a conversation this morning about how important it is not to just get up and talk about Jesus breaking the bread and giving thanks, but we need to know, church, that that this is a very real thing and that, that we need to examine ourselves. We need to find out, like, what in us is keeping us from you, God, or keeping us from a greater portion of you, whatever that is. Reveal it to me. I need to remove that. I need to eradicate that. I need to pull that root out of me. (laughs) Because the Bible says that whoever eats and drinks of the body and blood and doesn't examine themselves, eats and drinks judgment upon themselves. So important. We have to evaluate it. We have to be willing to lay it down. We have to be willing to lay some commitment down. That's what we did last week with these seeds. We laid down this commitment to allow the seed of the gospel to be planted deep in our lives. And we must evaluate ourselves based upon the word of God. That's, that's where we, that's our checks and balance, right? That's where we go. That's how we learn to live between that and the guiding of the Holy Spirit that is promised to us when we get saved. Amen. <laughs> we are God's field. We need to be ready. We need to get ready for the harvest that he's going to bring 
through what he's called you to do. Number three, third truth I've seen this morning, uh, we're going to jump back to, to, to verse one and two that I didn't even read yet, but it says this, it says, or here's the truth first, that even though we're a field in God's field, growth is not an option. Growth is not an option. I think it's an expectation that when you plant a seed, it, you should grow, that we would grow as Christians into mature believers in our faith. To be stagnant is not an option. To be still is not an option. And it's been said before, and I can't remember the many theologians who said it, but I know I've read it many times, but if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. Here, let me use some more biblical terms. If you're not growing closer to God, you're backsliding away from God. And Paul makes this comparison that's pretty interesting in the first two verses. He talks about this difference between milk which is for infants, and solid food, which is for mature people, right? This is what it says. It says, brothers and sisters, this hurts so bad. This would hurt so bad to hear this letter. Church, could you imagine me calling a meeting and us opening a letter from, from our district superintendent or our global superintendent and me reading a letter like this that says, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. That'd be hard to hear. And maybe it'd be good to hear. Maybe it would stir us to make change in our life, to, to be maybe a little more committed, right, to, to not doing things, but to Jesus. That's ultimately what he wants. A lot of times when people come to me and say, I just don't know what God wants from me in my life, I'm like, well, right now, apparently he just wants you. He's still molding and shaping you, and then he's going to send you out. And we're that field that we need to be ready. We need to be ready. And I think this passage, Paul, he clearly communicates that each person, all of us though, it's not necessarily all bad, but we all start out as infants in the faith right? We all start out at some point, and we, we got to grow. That's why I always say uh, to my mature believers in here, when we have new people coming to the church, whether they're, don't think of their physical age, but I'm talking their spiritual age, when we have people coming into our church, and, and we're quick to like see what's wrong with them, we need to remember that m maybe they're walking in as much light as they understand. It's our job to be that light, to show them the true light, to show them the truth, to show them Jesus Christ, to show them a better way, to show them holiness. I think that's kind of a problem that we have today, though. Stagnant is not an option. Sitting still is not an option, but some Christians seem to be very comfortable with their current relationship with God. They're in a good place. I call that complacency. Even harsher, I call that apathy. And they just don't know if they're really ready to move on. Because sometimes, you know, that's going to reveal some immaturity in us or maybe some, some sin, and, and it's not a good thing, right? It doesn't feel good for that to happen. But church, I want to tell you this morning, it's, it's our responsibility to take the necessary steps in our lives and even other people's lives, the people that we love to be agents of change that God intended us to be. We can't just sit around and just wait for, for God to save people. He already did that. He sent Jesus Christ, his son, to die on the cross for us while we were still sinners. He already came his way. Like, what are, you, what are we going to do? We can't just wait around and, like I said last week, put a book, put the Bible on our head and just expect the osmosis to kick in, right? That's not how it works. We need to be agents of change. And now I want to tell you a story that, that's not to boast about me or, or Terry. Terry's going to be involved. He didn't know I was going to share this. But it's to boast on Jesus and what he does and how when people are willing to, to, to be that agents of change, how God just does amazing things that are even beyond their imagination. You know, when we were serving in Fort Wayne, we, we had this, this passion for the homeless community. We're like, what do we do? What can we do? Can we do anything? And so the only thing we knew to do was to go buy some Little Caesars pizzas and go downtown. You may have heard part of this before, but to go downtown and go under the bridge, right? This isn't about Terry or me, but we're, and, and not only that, we feel, we feel kind of dumb doing that. I, I did. I'm like, this isn't going to make no change in people's lives. Like, pizza? <laughs> not in a town that has, like, rescue mission and, 
Sally, whatever, I can't remember what she did, that drive-in thing, Sally Ferguson. So, um, but, you know, I'm like, what are we doing? This isn't going to do anything. And I didn't want I kind of wanted to back out. Uh, yes, I did. I kind of wanted to back out. <laughs> Is the enemy on my shoulder saying, don't do this. It's dumb. It's not going to work. That seed's going to fall on rocky ground. Don't worry. Go ahead. Sow it. I'm just going to go take it away. <laughs> but we went, not knowing what to do. And we, we just handed out pizza. And we just talked. And we just prayed. And I remember one man, we went up to him. And I mean, he was tweaking. Like, is that, is that the terms? I mean, he was, I mean, we, oh, he almost called an ambulance. We thought he was overdosing. He, he's hunched over. He's just, he's just gone. And we didn't know what to do. And he finally slowly kind of came back around and was able to talk to us. He, he lit up a cigarette. He's just, you know, talking to us. He's like in third world right now. He doesn't know what's going on. But, man, that was hard. And then we met another young man that, that just wanted to talk to people. And then, like, next thing we know, this young man is, like, ministering to us almost. He's like, oh, yeah. He's like, you know, you guys should go down here. You guys should go here. Hey, do you have a business card? Yeah, a homeless man under a bridge asked me for a business card so he could point me in the direction of the new ministry. Man, I was disconnected. <laughs> I was living in the walls of the church. Man, we were broken that day. It led to, it led to so many things. And, and literally, like, Jesus just kept, like, just he was walking through the land with a machete, just chopping away all the weeds, man. And we were just getting through. And, and we just understand the doors were flinging open so fast that we, we didn't know what to do. Next thing you know, we're, we're, we get invited to preach uh, once a month on Saturdays. And so Terry and I would pack up the, 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 his vehicle, his music stuff, and my Bible, and we'd go down and we'd preach a message to 50, 60, 80, 100, 100 plus men. And then it never, it never amazed me when we got there, we, we saw something we never expected to see. We've we seen men that want to change in their life, real change. We see men that were ready for it, that were starving for it. We, we thought these men are going to be the, the bottom of, of the pit, the, the, the rock bottom, the, the nothing's going to get better from here, and, and I don't even know why you're here. We thought to see yawns and eye rolls. We did see some of that. We did see some of that. I ain't going to lie. But then it, it amazed me, like the very first night we had five, ten, like a 15 people some nights would come, and they would, they would surrender their life. They, would, they, would, they were saved, get saved. They would commit to Jesus that night. And, and we knew that it wasn't about us anymore. We knew that I, I didn't have an option to, to not grow into this thing that God wanted to use us for. And then that led into din Monday night dinners, and then it led into me teaching Bible classes every week there for a long time until we came here. And then we put people in place to, to continue that. But it was just so amazing to me that, man, God will take anybody. He took me, <laughs> Terry. He took, he took I, don't, I can't speak for Terry, but he took a guy who didn't even want to do it. And he used them as agents of change. Please don't think this is about me. It's about Jesus every step of the way. And what surprised me the most was how much I changed in the process. And that's why I say we have to be willing to be the agents of change, not just in our life, but in other people's lives. Not for our glory, but for his glory. Number four. Um, growth needs the right environment. I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 through 7. I'll be there in just a moment. But, you know, it almost goes without saying if I, if I talk about change, you know, you, you understand that not just for spiritual growth, but even for natural growth, it takes the right kind of environment for growth to happen. We learned that last week. All the seeds that fell on different kinds of soil in rocky places, it, it just didn't work in every situation. And so I want, what I want you to hear this morning is that it would be so ridiculous. You remember the apple tree I, I talked about last week? It would be so ridiculous and ludicrous for us to think that an apple tree could grow in the middle of the Sahara Desert. I, I, I've never been there, so I don't know. Are there apple trees there? I don't think so. I don't think it's conducive for growth, okay? There's no proper agents there to encourage growth, agents of change to encourage growth. And in the same way, guys, I think, church, I think it's so equally ludicrous for believers to think that we can have a robust and fruitful lives as disciples if we are constantly immersed in environments of sin and evil 
and that healthy situations where the divine agents of change aren't present. And so, so let me let us consider the way Paul presents it in Colossians 2, 6 and 7. He says, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. And so I want to put this in Pastor Travis' words and paraphrase. What Paul is essentially is saying is that uh, he's saying, do the things that you were doing when the gospel seed was first planted in you. Once again, over time, it's so easy for complacency and apathy and routine to creep into your life. Think about the moment you were saved. Think about the overwhelming joy that you had in your life. Think about the gung-ho-ness that you may have had to read your Bible and to pray. And then ask yourself, are you still, do you still have that same kind of fervor? Ask yourselves. I mean, are we where we were? Continue living in him. John chapter 15. You abide in me, I'll abide in you. Right? It's a promise. Root yourself in Christ by being devoted to the word of God, being devoted to church, being devoted to the fellowship of believers, to prayer and to worship. Continue to be, to be strengthened in your discipline and your commitment. And most importantly, do it with overflowing gratitude and thankfulness. And here's what I want to tell you. You know, church, it is pretty hard to remain in a stagnant place when you're overflowing with thankfulness for all that God's done in your life. That's so hard. We, we constantly just hone in and, and, and focus on the problem at hand, and we forget all that God has brought us through. We forget it all. It's so hard to remain in a dark place when we're thankful for what God's done in our lives. Even if that moment right there isn't working out the way you would like. I pray that as a church and as individuals, we could be willing to evaluate and scrutinize the environments in which we're trying to grow. Because some of us are in, immersed in some environments that just aren't healthy for growth. They just aren't conducive for healthy growth. Number five, last truth today, is this. This one's kind of this one's kind of interesting. We need to to recognize adversity as opportunity for growth. And, and a lot of people wonder why James, uh, the book of James, is one of my favorite books, if not probably my favorite book of the Bible. I just love the book of James. Uh, turn with me there to chapter one, verse two and four, and you'll kind of see. But church, I want you to know, like, admittedly, it can be hard to differentiate between unhealthy situations from seasons of adversity that God may be using to grow us. I, I really do. The Bible tells us often that we go through some fires, right? And, then, and if we stay true and we stay strong, we will be refined. There's, there's bad things. Right, last week I shared John 16, right? That in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. We are promised that junk is going to happen. That bad stuff's going to happen. Things that you don't like are going to happen in this life. People are going to come against you. Things are going to come against you. And you're going to hate it. But take heart. Your faith is in the one who has overcome the world. I think we're going to talk more about some of that next week, but I don't want to get into it today. But just in the light of today's teaching on growth, I think it's important to realize and to recognize that, that seasons of adversity can promote healthy growth. And this is why I love uh, the way James says it. He says, consider it pure joy. What are you talking about, James? I'm not having a good time right now, James. I, I don't want to consider uh, this, this bill I can't pay uh, fun, right? I don't want to be joyful about it. I don't want to be joyful about, you know, uh, being away from my family for a long time. I don't want to be joyful about losing my job. I don't want to be joyful about whatever that is. What are you telling me be joyful? This person's persecuting me. I don't want to be joyful about that. And James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, not just a few I listed, Many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. 
keep running the race. The Bible tells us to run the race is to win the prize, to win the goal, to win the crown, right? Keep running. It's so important to saturate all those bad situations and everything in your life uh, through prayer, especially in times of adversity. Seek counsel from other mature believers. Talk to them about the, 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 how do I discern, is this adversity in my life or is this unhealthy? Is this a thing that I'm going to get through or is this a thing that's going to keep dragging me down? Some of us just aren't humble enough to ask for help when we need it. We all have seasons of adversity. We all have trials. We all have an enemy. We all share an enemy. And sometimes we just need help from time to time. And here's the thing. It doesn't make you weak. You know what it makes you? Well, yeah. It makes you human. We all, we all go through it, guys. Every single one of us. Don't be too proud. Because, you know, if you do... If we can get to a place where we can be totally surrendered out away from pride, right? Usually when we are too afraid to ask for help or to ask for to help in discerning something, it's usually a prideful situation. But I'm telling you, when we can do that, when we can lay that pride down, when we can, when we can walk through with someone through, through the trials and adversity of our life, I promise you, you're going to come out a stronger and more mature believer than ever before. Because a lot of times, the enemy wants you, he just wants you to keep it in. He wants you to, to just bottle it up until you explode. And then he sits back and he eats popcorn and he watches the show. Now, don't stop eating popcorn because I said the devil eats popcorn. <laughs> but you, you know what I mean. I want to invite the worship team to come back up. Here's a pretty powerful thought, church. You might not be where you want to be right now. But by the grace of God, you're not where you used to be either. Think about it. I could dwell on my past and look at it as good or negative. I think his name was Michael Youssef. If you ever listened to like Whoa Whoa or whatever, he talks about this a lot. I think it was him. Uh, anyways, he talks about how like sometimes we like... We fall into two things where we are just so disgusted and so ashamed and so saddened and so hurt about our past that we forget passages that talk about forget the former things, I'm doing a new thing, right? And, or we look at those things and, and we say things like, oh man, yeah, I used to, I used to party. Man, it was a good time. It was great. Man, we used to throw uh, all-nighters all the time. We have all this stuff there. It was amazing. And then we say, yeah, but now I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm a good Christian boy now. I, I go to church and, you know, I'm good. I don't do those things now. And your, your, your past life sounds way more exciting than what you're doing now. Uh, you know what I mean? And so we fall into those traps, or then we're so, we're so stuck in, in where we used to be, and it's by the grace of God that we're moving forward. Trust in the process of growth that we see in Scripture. Church, you are God's field, and it is God who will work through the agents of transformation, the agents of growth, to bring about growth in you. Philippians 1 6 says this. I think I have it up here. I don't. I didn't put it up there. It says, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let God's work work in you. Embrace the opportunities to be a healthy part of somebody else's process. There's been times where, I mean, I've just been so, and, and kind of the rescue mission was one of them, where I was just kind of in a, in a rut. I was just in a, just in a law in my life, and, and I was just so stuck on my routine and what I was doing, and it took stepping outside of my comfort zone and realizing that God was right there with me, waiting for me to kind of, to kind of grow out of that, to embrace that opportunity a, a, as he was using me to minister to other people. Keep meeting together. Keep calling the people next to you, whoever that is that you're close to in the church. Call friends in other churches, whatever it is. Just, just keep connecting with other believers. Keep singing. We're going to sing in a moment. Keep singing. Keep praying. Keep pressing on. For those of you here today that are struggling, 
Maybe with some of the stuff I've said today, maybe stuff I've talked about, man, I, I hope that, that you can see that the gospel seed can be rooted so deep in your life that, yes, you can have growth. For those of us that hear that, that think, man, I'm a mature believer, I'm just waiting for Jesus to come back, well, that tells me there's more room for growth. <laughs> Could you guys play softly something? And last week, like I said, we laid these seeds down on this altar. And I know some of you may not have been here last week, so I have some seeds here. And if you want to make a commitment today to, 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 to make a change, to allow some agents of change in your life, you're more than welcome to come and grab one. It's, all, it's symbolic, but it really does mean something when we, when we stand up and we get up and, and we make a choice to, to make a change. And these seeds were laid down as a, as a sign of our dedication to allow the gospel seed to be planted deep in our lives. This week, I want to give you an opportunity to respond again. Today, I want you to pray for your seed. Maybe you didn't bring one. That's fine. But pray for the seed that's in you. Pray for the seed that, that, that has been planted in you, whether it was from a, from a message you heard one time, whether it was from a, from a scripture on a wall you read one time, whether it was from a, a relative, a loved one, whoever it was, the person sitting next to you. Pray for that seed that's been planted in your life. Pray for the seed of God's word to, to make some change in our lives, to not, be, to not be hanging out at the stagnant pond, right? To be, to be looking on to what God has in store for you. Pray that God will continue to grow that seed, even if you are flourishing in the kingdom right now. Even if you are, are walking strong in your faith, pray that no thing gets in the way. Not nothing, but no thing gets in the way. For it to sprout out strong roots that take hold in your life. Growing deep to where nothing can snatch it away. Pray that, pray that God would reveal to you any environment in your life that needs change for growth to take place. And finally, I'd ask that you'd pray that God would help you trust in him for kingdom growth. Growth that helps you endure the adversities of life. Growth that helps you for when you leave here today and the world smacks you in the face. And to have a trust in him so great that enables you to live for him every day by being a disciple of Christ who makes disciples. We're going to sing a song. You can come and pray over your physical seed that was up here if you want. You can stay in your seats and you can pray. Whatever posture the Holy Spirit leads you to do, do it. But I want you to think about that this morning. Like, it may seem silly to just talk about the seed that's planted and then to pray. And, and I know some of us can sit here and think that, man, I, I'm good. If you have that thought, you're not good. Man, pray that God will continue to grow in your life. That you will continue to grow. Let's sing this song. If you feel led to come, come. Pray however you feel led.
Father, I'm uh, so thankful for this morning. I'm so thankful for this word that you have given us this morning. I'm so excited for, for the messages to come, Lord, as you reveal them to me. <laughs> Lord, I pray you reveal them to all of us. And Lord, I, I just pray that, that this morning that each and every one of us have made that commitment to kind of to not just kind of, but just to go back to what we talked about a few weeks ago, about having a, of having a childlike faith, Lord. To just, to just remove and just, just to shed off this, this outer hard shell sometimes, Lord. To just be, to be vulnerable for just a moment, Lord. And to, to maybe recommit or to re-energize or to, to, to readdress our faith in you. Lord, I pray that right now and every day, Lord, that these roots begin to grow deep into the lives of those that hear your message. Lord, as we move into the next week and we continue this talk of growth and, and then pruning and, and harvesting and all these different, these different terms of agriculture, Lord, but ultimately, Lord, it's, it's about your word planted in our lives. It's about the Holy Spirit that you have planted into our lives as a promise, as a down payment for eternity to come. And Lord, I pray that each and every one of us today, we move closer today than we were yesterday. And the same thing for the days to come. And that not that we just completely forget our past, but we, we look at it as an agent of change that you have brought us through. All of it matters, every part of our life. It's our testimony. But how we live today, how we choose to be, who we choose to follow is the testimony that we get to share with the world today. So Lord, I pray that you strengthen your believers and you send them out this week with the grace, peace, and mercy that none of us really deserve, but you so freely give. And I pray this in your holy name. Amen. Man, you are just church. I pray you have a wonderful week.